Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Because you make me feel like I've been locked out of hell. A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. It's time for the Bonnie Cher Show, a whirlwind of wit, wisdom, celebrity, and the boomer life. With a little bit of this, and a lot of that, and so much more you don't want to miss, here's Bonnie! That's always so silly. Hello! Uh, Hello to my new friends, and... And my old from near and far, I'm your host, I'm Bonnie Cher, and I'm here to guide you through the worlds of entertainment, through the great boomer generation, and of course, the world of type 1 diabetes. Um, So, thank you for tuning in, and we invite you to either call in with any questions, 310-843-2826, or you can follow the hashtag BeShareRadio on Twitter. Before we get this show on the road, um, I'd like to say a special thank you to jazz great and Grammy winner Wayne Cobham for writing my super duper hero theme music. Um, and also, I'd like to say thank you to Corey Bond of Crown and Anchor Jewelry for providing me with the jewelry that I wear on the show in exchange for this promotional mention. Hi, Corey. Wearing your jewelry. Um, <laughs> when we come back, I have an incredibly talented uh, author, screenwriter, playwright, does it all. He probably does his own stunts, too. Anyway, I'm talking about, and we'll be speaking to, Michael B. Druxman. And when we come back, you'll know him, too. Your life story is more than the things you do. It's a story built on the moments you make today. impact you have on others. How big is your story going to be? Live your legend. Welcome back. Um, Author Michael B. Druxman is the absolute definition of a prolific writer. Um, Michael began writing professionally in the 1970s, starting with books about movies and movie stars, and then graduated to stage plays, screenplays, and novels. Um, He writes that he's directed for both stage and screen. And um, I believe the first book was My 45 Years in Hollywood, which... It's pretty self-explanatory, um, but we'll ask him about it. Um, this man is a Hollywood historian, let me say that. Um, so instead of me saying it, let's bring Michael on. Hi, Michael. Hi, how are you? I have to tell you, the first book was not my 45 years in Hollywood. My first book was a, uh, a book about Paul Muni. In fact, uh, well, there it goes those notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, then, and then I did Basil Rathbone. I mean, the, I've lost count as far as where my forty-five years came in. That was um, uh, 
actually the fir- I think the first book after I I, I moved to lo- moved to Austin, Texas. Mm-hmm. And when so. did, you were living here in Hollywood, how long have you been a Texan? Uh, I actually it's eight years this month. And uh, we moved in, we moved in '09. And, it's um, it's a lot different, but I guess that's what you're looking for, huh? Well, I didn't really want to move. My wife wanted to move, and uh, <laughs> but I don't really regret it. You know, I I, I kind of went uh, yelling and screaming, but um, I like it here. It's nice and quiet, and you know, Hollywood is not what it used to be. It wasn't and, what it used to be when it used to be either. <laughs> you know, but no, no but I, it's, I know it's, it's, it's the. Um, you know, when 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 I worked there, there was a you know a lot of I knew a lot of people from the old Hollywood, mm-hmm. and and you know the the people I grew up hero worshiping and you know admiring etc cetera, etc, cetera. and that's not there that doesn't the how the Hollywood of legend doesn't exist anymore. Now it's really just a business, and. Not a, you know, it's, I, I don't really think it's doing as well as it used to do. Uh, I think I agree with that. I mean, in terms of, I mean, when I look at talent, I don't see, yeah, somebody could have a name, but I don't see that same talent, top talent moniker placed on them and know that, I mean, they were there. I mean, you've written about so many You've written about Gable. You've written about Orson Welles, um, Paul Muni. One book that I'm very interested in reading now, and uh, I know a lot of people would also be, I was a huge Dinah Shore fan, and um, I see that you've written on her also. Now, you wrote, you write both books and two-act plays, am I correct? Uh, yes, uh, what, yes, stage plays about Hollywood, basically. I have, a, I have a series of plays called The Hollywood Legends. There's 16 plays in the series now, and uh, many of them been, have been produced around the country. And in fact, a couple of them, the, the play on Orson Welles and the play on uh, Clara Bow are available on audio. Yeah. Uh, for audio download. And all of the plays are available in paperback and on Kindle. Well, I noticed um, on Amazon uh, there were six pages filled with your work that was available. Um, Dillinger and Capone. That was that. That would be a hell of a show to watch. <laughs> well, that was a movie. They, they, you know, the, uh, Roger Corman turned it into a movie with uh, Martin Sheen and F. Murray Abraham. Ah. Yeah. And um, I wasn't too happy with the movie, the way what they did with it. But so I, you know, I had kept the rights to the publishing rights to the screenplay. So I, I put it out so people can read what I wrote. Makes sense to me. I would, yep. I would want to be able to do that, too. But when you're Michael B. Juxman and you have the body of work that you have, I think it's a little easier to get them to do what you want, no? Um, depends on, uh, you know, if it's a book or if it's a stage play, yes. If it's a movie, once you sign the contract, they can do whatever they want with it. You know, um, but stage plays, they can't change a word unless the, the playwright agrees. And same thing with books. That's the frustration about writing for the movies, but you, you make a lot of money writing for the movies. <laughs> So that's that's already the good part, because I was going to say, then why do you do it? And you just answered that question. Money is a great motivator. I, I, so I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> if it happens, I'll let you know. Um, so are you, are you still writing now, Michael? Oh, yeah. I have a book that just came out a couple of weeks ago called Hollywood Snapshots, The Forgotten Interviews. And it's basically a collection of, well, the first half, I used to write for Cornet Magazine, and the first half is uh, interviews I did with various celebrities like Claire Trevor and Mary Pickford and Paul Henry and Ann Miller and Howard Keel, uh, 
that ran in Coronet Magazine back in the 70s. And I've and ha- the, the reason I decided to do this book is I was going through my filing cabinet, and I came across all my interview notes from these interviews. And a lot of stuff that never wound up in the final article because there was really no place for it. So uh, I've added to the each interview quotes that never made the interview. And the second ha- then the, the second ha- part of the book is interview notes from my books on Hollywood, which ne- which didn't make the final book. And the last third are interview notes from my my Hollywood legend stage plays that didn't make the book that that did the word in the play. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of very candid remarks that, and um, what about the Hollywood scandals? Well, that's a collection of three of the stage plays, um, B movie, which is, uh, deals with the, uh, French Antone, Barbara Payton, Tom Neal affair, which was in the early fifties, which was, went on for years. I mean, a major, major scandal. Um, the second one is Sexy Rexy, which is about Rex Harrison and the women in his life, two of which committed suicide. And the third one is uh, Lana and Johnny Were Lovers, which is about the uh, Lana Turner, Johnny Stompanato affair and his murder. Fascinating reading. People, I mean, and there's, I, I know that how many people there must be who love stories about people that were famous and that they loved. You know, they used to really love your stars um, and they would want to know. And especially to be able to see that there's those people that you loved then are still very relevant now as such to be written about. And I, well, I love bringing these characters to life because I, I, you know, I love the old movies, you know, the 30s, the 40s, into the 50s. Uh, I, you know, you, you have legend. You, you know, the, the, the people who starred in those films were legends. You don't have legends anymore in no, Hollywood. Right. Or, I think the last living legend. Well, Olivia de Havilland is still alive, but but is Eastwood, Clint Eastwood, I think, has that legendary quality. But I can't think of any anybody beyond him that, you know, would ever equal a Bogart or a Cagney or a or a Betty Davis or a Joan Crawford. It's true. That, that that was sort of the point I was making earlier. I don't see that happening now. No. No, I, I totally agree with you. And the <laughs> stories that are told are usually not the nicest of stories. I don't see uh, any any real... I have a lot of, well, who cares? I mean, I personally care for an actor because of the work they've done, not who they're dating. Um, and I also see the other side of that, that when people... <clears throat> have those negative feelings it takes away from what they feel about a person's work so now if you put on your publicist hat how much do you divulge how much do you really let the public know about an artist or does that come back to bite them in the butt it seems like it's a lose-lose not a win-win well i think that the pro you know i think what happened is that Back in the day, uh, studios built their stars, and they built these you know, people like Gable, you know, and they supported them, and they they took care of everything. Today, you you don't have that anymore. The the, the studio will hire an actor, whoever or actress, whoever it might be, for one particular picture, and they'll they'll, they'll push them for that picture, and then the star, then the actor is on their own, and most of them in a relatively short period of time, fall by the wayside. Michael, Uh, please, hold that thought. I've got to take a break, and when we come back, we'll be talking with Michael B. Druxman some more and finding out, and I want to hear more about your book that you have out now and anything else you want to tell me. 
So hang out. We'll be right back with you. Come something to hide. I say we own it. Lose all that negativity. Just let it go. It's just bad energy. Oh, and lose those terrible black balloons they give you on your 50th. What's up with that? Hey, we hear you. That's why our members love AARP The Magazine. It celebrates you with fun and provocative content, from lifestyle and entertainment to in-depth reporting. And it's just one of the great benefits of membership. If you don't think this is right for me when you think AARP, then you don't know ARP. Get to know us at aarp.org slash possibilities. To be at peace with myself is the most prominent thing, and I am at peace with myself. I didn't build this deck, I'm just playing the game. <laughs> That's all. That's it. Meals on Wheels has given me a mode of freedom that I wouldn't have otherwise. I've been making sure they get the nutrition that I need, and it's a balanced meal. My name is Maurice McGriff. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say hello. Volunteer by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. Again, you are tuned to the Bonnie Share Show, and we have the pleasure of speaking with prolific, to say the least, writer Michael B. Druxman. So please join the conversation. You can call us at 1 323 or you can tweet the hashtag pound sign B Share Radio. So let's pick up where we left off before the break. And you were telling us about the book that you have now that you've just written and is available on Amazon. Yes, Hollywood Snapshots, The Forgotten Interviews. And um, there's some very interesting stuff in there that, uh, that, that, that I never made print in, in the articles, but they, the people told me during the interview and... Um, like Yvonne De Carlo was very, uh, you, you know, it's, we, we had lunch at the uh, Beverly Hills Brown Derby, and, and, and all she really wanted to talk about was sex life. Better than the menu? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I remember when I was working on my, researching my Al Jolson play, I I uh, went over to George Burns' house, and he gave me a lot of stories, which I think one of the funniest, which I'm not going to tell him here, because if you want to hear, it, it's one of the funniest stories I've ever heard about By the book. Jolson and, and, and George Burns. And you can, you know, George Burns really knows how to tell a story. And, uh, but there's a lot of stuff like that. You know, every, everybody had stuff that, stories and comments that, you know, could, and quite how- candid quite surprising. Let me ask you this, if I might, Michael. When you're preparing to interview, what's going on in your mind? What is it that you want to get? How do you go about eliciting the information that you want as opposed to that she wants to get laid? Um, Do you have your own technique of of interview style. I mean, how, okay. how do you it, get what you want? Okay, it's been a while because, you know, I, the people you know, the, that would want to interview the, for these plays that I write, and the, the, they're not around anymore. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, you, if you're writing a play, you, you have a general idea of, of what what direction the play is going to go in. So you're you you find you talk to the person and and you're trying to get stuff which will which will uh, give you more information on that direction. Uh, I did a book years ago, you know, on, uh, I, I wrote a biography years ago on Merv Griffin. It was an assignment, and Merv agreed to work with me on the book, and we spent many many days together. And, and, you know, I had. I had all the, uh, you know, read everything about him, and, you know, there were questions. And, uh, you know, we spent probably the better part of a week, uh, several hours a day, uh, and he would answer the questions and give me, give me anecdotes. And, um, but but if, if, you're to, if, if you're writing a, somebody else, you know, uh, and interviewing some, 
so and so to about Clark Gable, you're just going for their stories. You're not going for the and, and you might use it, you might not. There are many stories uh, that they, they give me that just doesn't fit into the play. Right. But you got to do your research. You, you, you research your subject first before you even go see them. And then you go for certain points. When you're doing that research, Michael, is there something specific within each person that you look for? Um, the subject or the interview? The person I'm interviewing or the subject? Well, the- I mean, I would imagine, well, I could be wrong. It's happened before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but well, once or twice, I think I, I remember two mirrors. Just no. Anyway, um, just no. Let, let, me, let me turn it around a little bit. Um, do some of the people, because I'm sure not everybody is the same, but do some of the people try and give you only one side of a story? Or do you? Or is that really what you want? Because it's their perception of what happened. Or if a statement is made, will you look to see if there's a counterbalance to that? Or do you let? Do you just give them what the time to say, and then you do your editing? But basically, sense. I let the I, you know I let them talk. I might have specific questions. I. I, I, you know, I don't challenge them, or I didn't challenge them, you know, and uh, people would, um, uh, I'd, I'd go in and ask them about X, and they'd tell me their story, and then I might have, you know, have some specific questions to ask them, but, you know, it, it, it would be, I'm just asking them about the, the, the specific thing I wanted to talk to them about it you know I wasn't in there to uh, challenge them you know I wanted information so, right 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 right. as opposed to a tell-all and looking for something to shoot them down with but every now and then you get a tell-all I remember when I was writing my the Dinah Shore book um, one fellow came I, I and Dinah would not co- did not cooperate on this book one bit she uh but I remember there was a guy who was in the musical, one of his, the musical groups that backed her on, on, on television. I, I can't remember the name. But he started telling me stories out of school about her, which, you know, I, 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 you know, I finally used some of this stuff, um, which I'm sure wouldn't have, if, had she been alive, wouldn't, wouldn't have made her happy. But uh, there was some very interesting um, things that this guy this guy revealed so you never know but, and then and then it's a matter of taste whether you really want to go down that direction or not yeah I can appreciate what you're saying um, so now that you've written books and you've written plays and you've re- written screenplays, anything else you're thinking about doing? And what what motivates you now? Are you going to write another book? What's up now? What do you well, I, I have a actually. I have. A, I'm glad you asked. I have. It's it's with the editor right now. Um, I I have a new novel coming out in the, in a couple of months. Um, it's called Jackie Goes to Dixie, and it's inspired. I, when I was a publicist, I represented m- many top comics who, who played Vegas, like Jack Carter and um, J- Jackie Vernon and Stanley Myron Handelman. And, uh, you know, I, I knew Don Rickles fairly well through Jack Carter. And they are the inspiration of this book, uh, of this novel about a Vegas comedian uh, who, in the in the nineteen mid nineteen seventies, is ac- accidentally or mistakenly booked for a one nighter deep in the Ozarks of Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> Consider the possibilities. Yeah, it should be. Uh, it should be out. In the next couple of months, it's called Jackie Goes to Dixie. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that, too. Um, Michael, 
you, can you share with our audience, please, how they can follow and know what's going on with you and when their the next book is coming out? Okay, and obviously we all know we can go to Amazon to buy um, the books, the many, many books and pl- two act plays which you've written and that are first are you getting clean cuz you have a date <laughs> i'm watching my intern no not you i'm sorry my intern is in there brushing himself off i thought he had a date sit down we're not done yet uh- <laughs> This is a crazy place. It's a well, so I was Hollywood, a crazy place. So I guess that's how I got here. Well, Michael, we want to stay in touch with you, but before I let you go, I asked you a question, and then I got on to costume control here. Um, how can our audience support you, follow you, find your books? Well, Amazon is probably the best place. I do have a website, but to be very honest with you, I haven't updated it for a couple of months because I. I as you know, I had surgery about five months ago, and uh, five weeks ago, and and you know I, I haven't been too active on on, on the website since then. Um, uh, but it's Druxman Works, D R U X M A N Works, W O R K S dot com, and I'll be you know I'll probably go on it soon and and do an update and. Um, and you are on Facebook. Uh, I've seen you're on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Michael B. Druxman. And um, uh, and are you it, not it, a Druxy? I'm sorry, at Druxy on Twitter? Uh, I don't really, you, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know. I may be. I, I'm on Twitter, I, but I don't Twitter very much. I'm <laughs> no, basically a I don't Facebook. tweet, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I I fought that too. Yeah. You want me to I've never what really, now? I've really never understood tw- the Twitter thing. I've uh, you know I I'll, I'll post something on there every now and then, but I've never really understood it. You know the. Uh, I, I just don't get it. You know. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm too old for Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that Twitter has an age limit so much as keeping certain people and their thoughts off of it, whose thoughts have no business being on a feed like that. But that's another story for another yes, time. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Yes, we will, because <laughs> they'll throw me right the heck out of here if I do any more of that. Um, yeah. In the meantime, Michael, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking your time and I chatting with us. Me too, me too. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. You be well okay, now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're back to me again. Everybody's looking at me. I'm supposed to. I said that. I did that. I said that. Oh, here's what I have to say to you now. Our song of the day is coming up next. Type 1 diabetes can be living in anyone. Type 1 diabetes is when your pancreas doesn't produce insulin. It's not caused by your diet. It's not caused by anything you did. Type 1 diabetes can be very serious. Blindness, amputation. Learn more about type 1 diabetes. Help support JDRF finding a cure. T1D looks like my brother. T1D looks like a friend. Type 1 diabetes looks like me. Here 
Beautiful song sung by a phenomenal singer. That was Miss Liz Calloway singing What a Funny Boy He Is, written by Alex Ryback and the late and great Michael Stewart. Uh, so welcome back to the Bonnie Share Show, Boomer Life. My co-host for this segment is Chelsea Wright. Rice, sorry about that, a member of the T1D community uh, from the great state of Alabama. Chelsea Rice is an Atlanta's Atlanta-based stand-up comedian and a type 1 diabetic, as well as being the creator of the Sugar Free Comedy Show. Um, Chelsea has participated in several non-for-profit fundraisers for the American Diabetes Association and was selected as one of Diabetes Forecast Magazine's 14 Amazing People to Know. Uh, so, hello, Chelsea. Nice to know you. Hello, Bonnie. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. Um, well, thank you. I know, Chelsea, that you're living with type 1 diabetes. Share your story with us, would you? Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of weird because I was diagnosed when I was 25. Um, uh, I was basically a just a regular 25-year-old you know, Unencumbered. kid in Georgia. Yeah, you know. And um, it, as it turned out, I started having the symptoms, the, the frequent urination, the always thirsty, that type of thing. And um, I was a musician in the church that I attended, and my roommate was a musician as well. And so he kept noticing that I kept getting up going to the restroom. And so he, out of, just, out of the blue, just decided to set up an appointment with a urologist for me. And going to the urologist, that's how I got diagnosed. Um, next thing you know, I was in a hospital for like, four or five days being filled with fluids and education. And it was quite life changing. It is that. And yeah. so now um, let's go over the, you know, kind of other stuff. Um, do you use MDI? Are you on a pump? Do you use a sensor? Do you loop? I still haven't figured <laughs> out that looping thing. I, I barely figured out how to knit. Uh, so tell yeah, me, exactly. what, what, what do you When you, you said do? loop, I didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> I, um, I use a pump. I've actually been on the pump, say, probably maybe seven years. Your recording has reached the and maximum I mean, length. I'm 52, to replay so your message, press 1. To years, delete so and re-record your message, press 3. New to the pump. For delivery options, and press 4. I to use send a, a fax, press now. To cancel for this message, maybe press star. To send this message now, four months press down. pound or and it's hang really up. Great. It helps a lot. I mean, it keeps me honest. It keeps me on my <laughs> on my game as long as I know what my to replay what your my message. Are press one. To I was delete and re-record your message, really press three. As as should, for delivery you know, options, press four. I don't, I don't think to send a fax, really press six. To cancel this message, you know, press this message every, you know, To send this message now, press Chelsea or hang up. Chelsea, I need you to hang up, my friend, and call us right back. We're having some technical problems here. To replay here. your message, press one. Thanks. Hang to up. To delete and re-record your message, press three. For delivery options, press four. 
To send a fax, press 6. To cancel this message, press star. To send this message now, press pound or hang up. Your message has been sent. Thank you for using T-Mobile voicemail. Goodbye. Bye-bye, T-Mobile. And no, that was not a commercial for them, as you can tell. <laughs> what? It wasn't a commercial? Are, are we back on? And oh, back. okay, we're back. Whew. I We're get, back. I mean, technical difficulties. I get upset with my pump. A whole studio, I could screw up the whole studio with one call. Yeah. But we're no, stronger they, than that. I, I love the feeling. Mm hmm. Okay, so I heard most of what you said. I'm not sure everybody else did, though, and I kind of don't have any way to find out. So we're just going to move on, knowing that you've been at T1 <laughs> since you were in your 20s and yep. you're pumping. And um, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, um, do you think there could be a cure? You know, I, I, I admire people who are optimistic about there being a cure, but my cynical side says until, you know, until they can find a way, I mean, look, bottom line, they can't make any money off a cure. Uh, and there's too many people making money. <laughs> so, well, I, mean, that's my I, I can ap- I can appreciate that to some extent, but I mean, especially when you're talking about medical research here in the United States, um, right. because it I mean it's an enormous industry, and no, and they don't oh, really yeah. want to. But but then, what about the other countries who? are doing the research, countries like Israel, countries like Canada. I mean, Edmonton has been an epicenter for diabetes since the days of Banting and Best. Um, And, of course, they're the guys who didn't want us to have to pay for anything, especially our insulin. And what about that? I mean, the prices, it's not bad enough that we're labored with a disease, a condition, a way of life. Yeah. Um, but now, I mean, yes, I do have insurance and my, I do have a copay on my insulin and that's for one bottle a month. And then what happens when, when you open the refrigerator and you think you have the bottle of insulin in your hand and it gets caught on a sleeve and on the door and it crashes? Well, that's almost a five hundred dollar yeah. boo boo. Yeah, exactly. And, and there are a lot know, of people who can't come up with the but, five bills. No, not because I've been there. I mean, I was unemployed back in two thousand nine. I got laid off. <clears throat> Fortunately, I was able to get some insurance through the uh, Department of Labor. But there were a lot of people that weren't, you know, able to do that. You know, and I couldn't imagine being, you know, unemployed now and having to deal with the price of insulin because I had, I even had a friend of mine that worked at a local a drugstore chain and she showed me what the price was on her. She just took a snapshot of it with a camera Mm -hmm. and showed me what the price was. It was over like, you know, well over $300, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can't imagine what that would be like for somebody that that doesn't have insurance. And the other day uh, I saw on the news, they did a story about people who've been uh, going to Facebook and going to these secret groups and bartering and trading for insulin. And yeah, it's, so I know it's just exactly amazing what, what people. It's, it's just amazing what they have to go through. Well, I think another part of that is there's no way, unless you purchase that bottle of insulin, assumably uh, from an upright, righteous kind of pharmacist, at which point right. you know that that clear, for sure, that that clear liquid in your bottle is in fact insulin. Well, they've changed our cancer medications. Things happen. So what yeah. about the patient who gets that hinky bottle that is watered down insulin? Because anybody who's ever been around insulin knows it has an aroma about it that does not yep. exist with anything else. And if you're absent that aroma, you're probably absent insulin. Um, and so, yeah. they, so what? They just die Oops, my bad. What? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and even even the fact that the insulin may have just expired or gone bad. You, I mean, to the 
talk to obviously the people to the train dive and come out on cloudy or things of that nature, but some people may not be, you know, knowledgeable about that. And so it's, I, I, you know, is this people, a lot of people don't take this as serious, you know, as they should, because our people don't respect it as much as they should. They think it's just something that you just get, you know, because you didn't exercise or you didn't eat well or whatever. And it's just not, that's yeah, so not totally So there's a blame the that's put on the yeah. patient, which yep. is ridiculous, uh, especially yeah, in the very, case of type one. I mean, there is, believe me, if there was a way to stop this, somebody would have figured it out by now and not just from <laughs> yeah. your eating and your exercise, which of course goes hand in hand. But with, whereas with a type two, it's possible that they can get along but with a type one it is absolutely impossible and um you know going back to what you were saying before about the um the business of diabetes yeah that's certainly the case here in the states but i'm not sure that worldwide they have that same thing going on also um Something that weighs heavily in my mind is the fact that we don't cure any diseases. When I say the world, I mean we, I mean the world. Um, we haven't cured right. a cold yet. Um, I think also my thought is, you know, I don't think they're holding anything back from us. Um, I think we don't have the science, and I think that... Um, you know, once that code is brought to light, is worked on, you'll see the fall of many diseases. But is that in my lifetime? No. Is that in your lifetime? I hope so. Is that in the lifetime of humans younger than you? They don't have a choice here. Uh, yeah. Because you're too young. Um but I, I try not to get hung up with what they aren't doing. I try and push what they are. I remember, you know, my early years of being a diabetic, uh, for testing we had these little tubes and you put some urine into them and a little eyedropper and tossed a tablet and it turned funny colors and got really hot. Um we never had a blood test. I remember I I oh. I had needles, but we boiled our syringes. So there there are lots of things being done, just not a cure. Um, right. And how possible really is that? So um, I believe in what I can see and taste and touch not what may be coming. Um, I'm going to probably get lamb. I hate to say that, especially to parents of young children with T1, but, and maybe their story will be different, and I pray to God that it is. But uh, for us who are already in this D1, T1 complex, um, it's really about taking the best care of yourself you possibly can and being your own physician. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree because I, like you said, I have more faith in you know, the research advancing, you know, overseas than I do here. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally open to that. But like you said, I don't get wrapped up in, you know, we've got to have a cure. got to have a cure. I, well, I'm kind of concentrating in the right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I concentrate on what we have now. Yeah, I mean, look at look at what was coming along with Apple of all people. They're coming up I with know. a. I know. I think it's a band that's going to go on the the Apple Watch. They can actually check your blood sugar, you know. And it, like I said, that's not coming from a pharmaceutical company or a, a medical company. That's coming from an elect, electronics company, you know. Right. And so <clears throat> there are people that are that are making advances, and obviously in that case, people that aren't even so much directly connected to healthcare. So. You know, you just have to concentrate on the right now I and, and hope for the best. Yeah. All right. Well, I have I have so many questions, but not enough time. So before I get to more questions, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, we have to have you back on. Um, but let, let's just talk about um, 
I understand that your comedy relates to the fact that you are a type 1 diabetic, and I love how you married those two items. Um, I mean, it's not like a yuck, slap your knee kind of concept. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, you have a disease that's going to strike every organ in your body. No. Right. Give yeah. me a little feel of what it's like to be Chelsea Rice on stage talking about his diabetes. Yeah, I mean, one thing, I guess one of the bigger things I talk about is my uh, my eye surgery. I had like a two vitrectomies, you know, in I have vitrectomy in each one of my eyes. And my right eye pretty much isn't 100%. It's more like maybe, I don't know, 20%, maybe 10% right now. So I what I do is like when I tell jokes about diabetes i don't make joke about diabetes as a whole i talk about my experience and that with diabetes and like i said i had to find something funny about you know losing vision in my eye I and so, so i talk about i talk about the eye surgery because I, there were things that happened when i got my eye surgery that i just didn't understand for one you know i didn't understand why i had to strip down to my underwear to have eye surgery <laughs> <laughs> and then you know because they it wanted you <laughs> And I, like I, said, right. I had to That's monitor funny. YouTube. I had to go monitor YouTube to see if there's some sort of wild video of some guy laying on an operating table, <laughs> you know, with a with a chimpanzee riding around with a, you know, firecrackers popping around him and stuff. It's just, you know, I don't know what happened in that operating room. And like I said, it was blistering cold in there. And I'm in my underwear having eye surgery. I'm pretty sure they could have done eye surgery with me wearing a parka. What? You know. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, I don't really see that. But as then, the, then it wouldn't have been worth as much money when they really have to like get you. Oh, okay, this must be a big deal. I have to go in my underwear. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is going to be one of those kind of surgeries. All right. <laughs> well, listen, I wish you nothing but the best of health, the best in your work life. Um, Please stay in touch with me. I want to have you back oh, yeah, on again because this amount of time was just not enough for us. So if you'll yeah. do that, I'll remember to set up another date with you. Please, before I let you go, tell our audience how they can follow you. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, my name is C-H-E-L-C-I-E, Rice, like the food. Uh, on Twitter, with a at lot of carbs. Chelsea Rice. <laughs> Yep, and on and on Instagram, I'm Type One Comedian. I like it. I like so it. Well, uh, Type One Comedian, you keep uh, comicating, and uh, <laughs> I look forward to communicating with you in Absolutely. the very near future. Chelsea Rice, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bob. Coming up will be Boomer News and views from my soapbox. You know, my take on who got it right and who should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, back in 60 seconds. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a social worker. When I found out that I had hepatitis C, I was a single mother, and I was absolutely terrified. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, estimates there are close to 3 million baby boomers infected with hepatitis C. Because there can be no symptoms for decades, most don't even know it. But if detected in time, hep C can be cured, and the treatment is simple. Today I feel great. I'm a healthy 65-year-old, I bike to work, I go to the gym, and I've cleared the virus. The CDC is urging everybody born between 1945 and 1965 to get tested. It's an easy one-time blood test that may be covered by insurance. I got a disease that could have killed me, but I saved my own life by getting tested. Don't wait. Ask your doctor about getting tested for hep C. Because knowing is everything. Today's Boomer News comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. And it's called The Impact, The Economic Impact, When Baby Boomers Retire. 
retire is one of the most important personal financial decisions anyone can make. Well, it turns out that it also has a profound macroeconomic impact that we are only now beginning to appreciate. Economists have known for a long time that as the U.S. population ages, it'll tend to slow down economic growth just because we'll have a smaller workforce as a result. But there's new evidence that suggests there's another impact on the economy that's potentially even more important. Because older workers tend to be the most knowledgeable and the most experienced, when they retire, that hurts the productivity of everybody left behind. And that drags on the economy through productivity growth. These findings come from a new economic research paper that just came out in the last week. The economists looked at all 50 states, they looked at the ones that aged faster, and they found that in those states, economic growth slowed more. About a third of the slowdown was because their workforce wasn't growing as quickly, but the rest of it was because the remaining workers just weren't as productive. You know, this kind of makes sense. Older workers aren't just the ones who are most experienced and capable, they also tend to make the people around them more capable and more confident and knowledgeable about how to do their jobs. If you look around the country right now, there are employers from coast to coast grappling with the fact that some of their most experienced employees are now coming up on retirement and they're very worried about how to replace them. There's a lot of sort of tribal knowledge that you acquire on the job that you cannot simply teach in college. The country as a whole needs to come to grips with this because if it doesn't, it's facing a double whammy from the aging of the population. This, I think, adds an extra impetus to a lot of the discussion now that we should do more to extend retirement ages, both in private pensions and in Social Security. And now we've come to the point of the show where I get up on my soapbox. You know the part where I'm going to shout out to who I think did something terrific, really terrific, and my shout down, well, not so terrific. Okay, so let's start out by my giving a huge shout out to the folks at what's known as DPAC, which stands for Diabetes Patient Advocacy Coalition not only for their continuing work at advocacy for diabetics, but now they've designed a mobile app. Um, and it makes it so easy now for you to instantly connect with your senators and your representatives, tell them what's on your mind, and those folks at DPAC have put it into one handy-dandy little app, which I strongly suggest you download. There is a platform for both um, Apple and what's the other one if you're not? Oh, then you're an Android. That's what you are. So no matter what you are, if you're an Apple, you're an Android you can still take advantage of this. And um, I just think it's, uh, I've downloaded one for myself and uh, I highly suggest the rest of you do too. Now for my shout down. Uh, I mean, we're going to be talking about the price of insulin right now. Um, Interesting that Chelsea brought it up with me just a few minutes ago, seeing as that's what I had in mind to shout down. You know, pretty much everybody blames the other guy. Um, if it isn't big pharma, then it's the insurance companies. And then when they don't want to take the heat anymore, well, they charge, you know, throw it over to the pharmacy managers. Um And and all they do is blame one another, and that's the game which, I guess, keeps them from really doing anything about this issue. Why? Because of the greed. Um, the report also that Chelsea and I had seen appeared on NBC News, and it talks about the fact that diabetics are having to go to black market sources um, to obtain their insulin. This has to change. This must stop. Um, we're not talking about Cialis. We're not... People will die without their insulin. And it only takes a very short time uh, for that to occur. Please get on board. 
diabetic or not. And please go to the DPAC app on your phone and start reaching out to your community of senators and representatives. Um, there has to be a change. There must be a change. And heaven only knows what's going to occur from now on if, in fact, ACA is going to be replaced and repealed. And even if it's not, I can barely afford it now. So that's what I've got to say about that. Um, in the meantime, before we say goodbye, I really want to thank my guests, Michael B. Druxman and Chelsea Rice, for spending their time with me today. Uh, and that's our show. And I sure hope you come back next week for another 50 minutes and another trip in the world of entertainment, uh, the boomer generation, and this group of us known as type 1 diabetics. Um, until then, you can visit me on bonnyshare.com. Uh, you can follow number one, Bonnie Share, on Twitter. Um, oh, I know where else you can find me. <laughs> you laugh. Uh, it's the Bonnie Share. No, it is not. Scratch that. You would think I'd know this, right? It's Bonnie Sings Lena Facebook fan page. Um, many of you are aware of the incredible role that Sammy Davis Jr. played in my career and in my life. He was my mentor and he was my friend. And I like to end each show with a nod and a wink to Sammy much in my little Carol Burnett style. But here's to you, Sammy. See you next week. Bye-bye now. <laughs>